every now and again, I will have this thing that happens where I'm like, well, if you're the person you say you are and claim to be, then you have to do this. And then whenever I feel like things are too hard, like I can't, I don't know if I can write this piece about Palestinians, the ghost of Harry Tubman will show up and be like, oh, is it hard to write an op-ed? <laughs> writing an op-ed hard? I'll be honest with you. Uh, people come up to me and say, you've been so brave. And I'm like, please don't say that. It's, emba it's embarrassing. I literally run my mouth for a living. I have no other skills in life. You know, when they write the book of this time in history, this, there's going to be this weird uh, footnote about like, and it also brought Macklemore back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mehdi Hassan. And I'm Debbie Kamau Bell. And we're not kidding. A new podcast from Zatea where I get to talk to funny people about serious stuff and about some funny stuff. Kamau, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. I've been a fan of yours for such a long time. Welcome. That, that's ridiculous. You're far too serious and astute a person to have paid attention to my nonsense. But thank you for saying that for the purposes of this podcast. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, uh, it was in the contract. So I, I said it and we can move on now. No, no. I've, I've watched all your stuff. I've watched your Netflix special. I've watched your CNN show. What's funny is, or maybe not funny, is you and I are doing a podcast together at here for Zotero, uh, even though we both used to have shows on cable. You had a show on CNN until I believe you got... Chris Lichted, uh, and I had a show on MSNBC until it got cancelled uh, a few months ago. And yet here we are. Yes. Here we are. You've got a new production company that you set up called Who Knows Best Productions, and I set up Zateo, and it's great to sit down with people like you. You've also got a great uh, Substack, Who's With Me. We're on Substack. So I think we're enjoying life. Are you enjoying life? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's freedom. You have to enjoy the freedom if you can't enjoy the paycheck. So yeah, I'm enjoying the freedom. And I think it's a it's a time to be free. I sort of see me and you as like, you know how Spider-Man and Batman are in separate universes, but every now and again there's a crossover. We're yes. finally having our crossover universe. You, of course, are Batman. I have to be clear. And I'm Spider-Man. I'm actually very anti-Batman because I just think if I had that much money, I would yeah. not go around in the middle of the night punching muggers. I'd probably yeah. invest in social programs, wrap around childcare, the kind of things that actually cut crime. Sorry, that's the lefty in me uh, pushing <laughs> back against Bruce Wayne, our capitalist oligarch uh, vigilante reactionary. But that's just me, even though I do love the movies. You know, I think it's funny how superheroes often outlive their usefulness. And I think everybody is now too too aware of a uh, wealth inequality and billionaires not being taxed effectively enough to think this guy's taking his billions of dollars and making w war weapons for his toy collection. <laughs> like, it's just like Yeah. And just dealing with such random crime. Like I'll do, you know, beating up muggers. It's like, come on, what about white collar crime? Come on. But yes, uh, we are delighted to be in this crossover. It's delighted to have you here. And I agree with you. People keep saying to me, how are you doing? How are you feeling? And I say what you say. Freedom is great. Freedom has never tasted this free. Uh, I now get to say stuff like Donald Trump is a racist, fascist crook. And no one's going to call me. I'm not going to get any calls. There's not going to be any issues about what the rules are. Because I make the rules. It's great. As do you. Um, Luckily, in in contract, I was allowed one of those a year. So you were allowed stuff. one. You were allowed one. So, come on. When I thought about this podcast, I just treated it like a kid in a candy store. Someone who loves comedy, loves entertainment. Say, so who are the really smart comedians who will uh, speak with me? Who I can get together and we can co-host a show with. But um, the the question I have is. Why would I pick Kamal Bell apart from the fact I think he's funny, I think he's interesting? And I'll, I'll be honest with you, one thing jumped out to me, and it was a Daily Beast piece you wrote uh, at the end of last year, on December 30th, and it's, it was headlined, Palestinians are my heroes of 2023. And you wrote in that piece, I've known Palestinians who've been speaking up for their humanity tirelessly for years. They do it when Palestinians are all over the news and when the world would rather look away. And I read that and I thought to myself, the world would also rather Kamal Bell wasn't saying stuff like this. And I just wonder, before we get going, and we've got a lot to talk about today, and I just want to get a sense of, were you worried when you wrote that piece? Did you think you might get cancelled? I mean, it's funny to say canceled. I mean, I, first of all, I don't believe in cancel culture is, is as ubiquitous as people think Agreed. it is. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't worried I'd get canceled. I did know I was going to get some level of blowback. But the thing about me you should know is that my imagination is so wild and out there that I'm imagining a way worse response than usually I get. Writing Very similar. Like yeah, no, it's, it's the ghost dog philosophy. If anybody knows the movie Ghost Dog, imagine your worst defeat so then you can actually maybe get victory. So I... uh I, cer I certainly knew what I was getting into. I certainly knew that like a lot of people who might be fans of mine might think differently. 
you know, but I'm also the guy who did a four hour Bill Cosby doc. I'm the guy who met with the KKK. So in some sense, my my whole career is based on doing things that maybe don't make logical sense. But every now and again, I will have this thing that happens where I'm like, well, if you're the person you say you are and claim to be, then you have to do this. So yeah. you can't turn away from this if you're the person you claim to be. And then whenever I feel like things are too hard, like I can't, I don't know if I can write this piece about Palestinians, the ghost of Harriet Tubman will show up and be like, oh, is it hard to write an op-ed? <laughs> Writing an op-ed hard? Oh, okay. I, I, I'm, I'll be honest with you. Uh, people come up to me and say, you've been so brave. And I'm like, please don't say that. It's, emba it's embarrassing. I, I literally run my mouth for a living. I have no other skills in life. Uh, yeah. This is what I do. And, you know, yes, yeah, some of us are trying to push back against horrible status quos and, and kind of lazy consensuses and conventional wisdoms. But yeah, Harriet Tubman uh, would, would laugh in our faces. I think that's yeah. fair to say. And uh, as, would, as would everyone else, uh, as Donald Trump thinks they're all alive, so they could come up to us and uh, say that to our face. It, it's funny because I, I think about, I was thinking about the whole quote unquote cancellation. And actually it's funny you mentioned cancel culture because I've always been someone who says, stop with the whole right wing nonsense exaggeration about cancel culture. Everyone's fine. Uh, Chappelle is fine. I've always said the one real cancel culture that no one wants to talk about is Palestinians because they have been canceled for a long time and pro-Palestinian voices. And yet you see what Macklemore has done, Kamal, is really yeah. interesting because his song, Hins Hall, I believe has now hit top 10 on three different billboard charts. And I look at that and I think, hey, good for him and great song. But also he's actually uh, showing the world that you can be vociferously mm -hmm. F-bombed pro-Palestinian and actually still prosper. Because a lot of people in our world, in my news industry world, in your entertainment world, do worry like, if I say this, what's going to happen to my career? And he's actually showing people, mm, you can be successful i mean i think yeah i think one of the most um you know when they write the book of this time in history this there's going to be this weird uh footnote about like and it also brought macklemore back <laughs> and he's been political for his whole career i want to be clear about that but the fact that it brought him back to prominence and that he's giving all the proceeds to unra and i also want to think that this is the other thing that's important about this is this is one of those examples of he's using his white privilege in a way that he can he can get away with something that maybe a palestinian rapper is not going to get as much attention for so there are certainly palestinian rappers who rap about palestine and palestinian musicians but they're not going to get the attention of a mainstream white man like macklemore so thank thank shout out to him for using his white privilege for good I agree with you. And if we're going to do shout outs for the, the right use of white privilege in this historical moment, I've got to give a shout out to one of my favorite actors, Guy Pearce, uh, LA Confidential, Me Memento, great movies uh, if people haven't seen them, who I didn't realize come out is really, really pro-Palestinian. He's spoken out very vocally about uh, the genocide calling for uh, Palestinian human rights. And when you're at his level, I guess you can't cancel him so easily. So I don't know if you saw this ridiculous uh, thing that happened the other day where Vanity Fair, uh, Vanity Fair France, I think it may have been, uh, did a photo shoot with him at a film festival there and he was wearing a Palestine uh, lapel pin and they just airbrushed it out from the picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, just, and then they called it a mistake, I think. Like, oh, it was a like a oopsie, like an oopsie. oopsie. Yeah, an oopsie. We, we, we didn't accidentally airbrush out his watch or his bow tie. Yeah. It's just, just the Palestine yeah. flag. That's where our hand fell as we were smudging. The, the what was interesting is he still had a bracelet on that went Palestine colors, so they didn't catch that. But um, at least they had to apologize. If we're going to do some shout outs, yeah, I'm gonna be let's do quick. it. I just want to shout out because I got into some some back and forth with some people who are unhappy with my uh, thoughts about Palestine on threads, which I thought was supposed to be anti-Twitter, but it seemed to be as Twitter as Twitter is. Uh, and I was talking about, uh, like, a lot of the people who've taught me about Palestine have been Jewish people in my life. Uh, you know, Jewish people who are who are who who believe in their Judaism or proud of their Judaism, and yet are also understand that Palestine should be free. And I think that a lot of people want to act like a black man like myself who's talking about that somehow is just inventing it out of whole cloth and not actually in community with people and specifically with Jewish people. So I want to shout out my uh, Miriam Kleinstall, Adam Mansbach, Nato Green, three Jews who I don't even think know each other, but are all people responsible for helping me understand the situation. But so, let's not, let's not you, shout out to Mark Zuckerberg, whose threads and Facebook haven't been uh, great on this. Threads has been really bad, Kamal, for, for Israel. So anytime I post anything on there, I get immediately shouted down by people saying, but Hamas uh, on Threads. So Threads hasn't been great. You're right. It's supposed to be the anti-Twitter, but not on this issue. I would also do a shout out to Major um, uh, Harrison Mann, who is a Jewish American soldier who quit the government, quit the DIA. He was on my show, Mehdi Unfiltered, earlier this week, talking about his Jewish American values led him to that position. He said, I can't be 
complicit in this. So what's interesting is our, uh, you know, the most read piece that we've published on Zateo since we launched Kamal uh, is a piece from a, a, a Jewish Columbia University student called Jonathan Ben Menachem, who wrote about the encampments and wrote about how it's been completely distorted and the biggest threat to Jewish safety on campus is actually the police. And we know that because uh, a guy fired his weapon, a police officer uh, fired uh, his gun accidentally uh, in Hinds Hall. Uh, during those protests in the Columbia Hall. And I just think you and I uh, have both, I think, posted this separately, but I wanted to chat with you about the idea that being on the wrong side of students on this issue is an interesting one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think this is something that I, I'm saying it occurred to me, but I sort of I was reading a lot and it revealed itself. And I've seen other people write about this too, and you've talked about this, that when you look at the history of social justice movements in this country that have led to positive change, it is generally, if not always, led by young people. And I think we forget that because you start to look back in the past and see these black and white photos and everybody looks like they're like they're 50. <laughs> these are young people. If you talk about like the sit-ins that started the civil rights movement were, were, were uh, black men who were going to college in North Carolina and T in Greensboro. These are college students. When you talk about the Vietnam, anti-Vietnam war movement, that was young students on college campuses. When you, you know, we think of Greta Thunberg as being like so young, but generally the activists have been closer to her than the age of Noam Chomsky. You know what I mean? Yes. So it's like, we have to understand that like, and the other thing I think is interesting is that young people, I, I have a hard time finding out, finding a time when young people who've come out in mass in this country have been wrong. You know what I mean? That's like good, That's a very good point. I'm sort of looking through, I was like, there must be a time where young people showed up and history was like, man, they were all, they were wrong. I, their batting average is pretty high. It may be a hundred percent, but it ain't, it ain't, it ain't 50%. And I mean, you think about the Black Panthers. I'm here in Oakland. The average age of the Black Panthers was like 19. Wow. You know, I did not know I, that. Yeah. That, I, I found out Erica Huggins is a friend of mine who's one of the Black Panthers. And so I think we think of these people as being old because we look back, but these are young people and young people have been on the right side of history way more times than they haven't. And I'm talking about young people when they show up in mass. I'm not talking about a few hundred white supremacists who show up in like Charlotte's in Charlottesville or someplace because they couldn't get a national rally if they wanted to. So I'm talking about when young people show up around the country in mass, they have been on the right side of history way more times than they have. It. Glad you added the Charlottesville exception to the young people rule. Not the bunch of, not the small group of uh, crazy yeah. Nazis with tiki torches, not them. No. When I listen to you talking about the batting average, it's so powerful. It's so true. And, you know, feel free, uh, people listening to this, watching this, to, to stick it in the comments. If you can, if you can prove Kamal wrong, good luck to you. But what's so interesting is you could actually take that to another level and say, not only have the students been on the right side, but guess who was on the wrong side of all those issues? Segregation, Joe Biden. Vietnam, mm -hmm. Joe Biden. Iraq mm -hmm. war, Joe Biden. So if today you're saying, hey, when it comes to Gaza, should we listen to Joe Biden or the kids? I'm going to say the kids. I generally want to support the people, not the politicians. This is way bigger than the politicians. The people are here to push the politicians to do the right thing, whether the politicians want to or not. I think Lyndon Johnson and the Civil Rights Act is a good example of that. Like you, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement pushed the Civil Rights Act, and the politicians had to do it whether they wanted to or not. And I think that, you know, and even back to the age, Martin Luther King Jr. was 39 when he was assassinated. I know he looks 50 or 60 because <laughs> he had a lot of pressure on him, but he was 39 years old and had been in the movement since his 20s. Insane to think that, yeah, I always think of Dr. King as an older figure, he's younger than me. Uh, yeah. Also, it's funny you mentioned Dr. King because we hear a lot of Dr. King references from the Republicans these days. It's like, everyone has that one quote. They only have one MLK quote, right? Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> right, they only have one quote. And then even liberals, white liberals, forget the letter from the Birmingham jail and mm -hmm. instead they just go, oh, but we should all protest like MLK protests and that's why he was so successful and popular even though he wasn't popular when he was doing the kind of protests that students are doing today for Gaza. No, no, and, and experienced violence and, and at the hands of the police when he was doing the kind of protests we wanted him to do. So, yeah, I think that we have certainly defanged Martin Luther King Jr. And we also, again, he was 39. His thinking was clearly evolving as he was, as he was in his life. One of my favorite things to do is on King Day, Democracy Now will play the speech he gave, like right before he, like one of the at the Riverside Church, yes. and it's very anti-capitalist, very anti-imperialist, and a lot of people are like, that's when uh, the forces at, at, at in charge of this country, are like that's enough for him. <laughs> you know, like, that's <laughs> enough now that he's starting to get. It's enough about black people, but he's talking about the world and the United States government. So 
I he's think talking the, about war, right? Which a lot of these yeah. protests, we could call them Gaza protests. They are fundamentally anti-war protests. They are saying the United States government should stop funding a foreign war, which is what MLK was saying. And every time I go to the MLK Memorial, I live in, I live in the DC area and I love taking friends and family to the MLK Memorial. And I always point out to them, look at the wall of all the quotes. You've got all the great quotes, the arc bending and all the great you know, content of my character. Guess what quote is not on the walls of the official DC memorial? The quote from that Riverside speech where he says, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world is my own government, right? That's yeah. the quote. No one really wants to share that one from Dr. King. Yeah. Is the message to the white moderate there too? Is that quote up I, there? I don't see that one either on the wall. But, you know, that's why people hated him at the time. And I, I use the word hate uh, advisedly. Uh, we just, just pulling out this poll. When he died in the immediate aftermath of his death, just so people are aware, a lot of Americans had a negative view of King. Nearly a third, 31%, said he brought his assassination upon himself. Mm. Less than a majority, 43%, said they were sad, 38%, or angry, 5%. Only 5% of Americans were angry that Dr. King got killed. Yeah, I think this is the, we, you know, we love to we, uh, engage in revisionist history in this country, and we love to tell the story that is most convenient. And so once, I, and there's a real confusion that I've always run into that people think, celebrate him as a hero and forget the part he was assassinated <laughs> like he was not he didn't die of old age we sort of want to pretend he like not. as if he accomplished as if he was like i think i've done all i can do now i'm just gonna disappear like tupac on an island you know what i mean we act like he just sort of disappeared he was assassinated and many people were happy he was assassinated and he was not popular in his lifetime and then over time he becomes a postage stamp and a holiday but even when it became a holiday, it like Arizona, the state of Arizona didn't want to celebrate the holiday. So this is a man who was way more controversial than we give him credit for. Yeah, even people like John McCain voted against making a holiday back in the 80s, who's considered a, a great moderate Republican in death. So, Kamal, one of the reasons I was so excited to co-host this show with you today is I'm just so frustrated, not just by all of the student protests and the horrible reactions to them, but specifically the brutal police response to all of these historic anti-war pro-Palestine student protests. And I want to talk about what that police response tells us about the police, about America, and about protests. Because I feel, I know people hate the I word, they hate intersectionality, but I feel like so many things are going on when we talk about Gaza, right? Yes. And it's like, all right, we're talking about racism, that's familiar. We're talking about war and militarism, that's familiar. Oh, wait, what's the police role in this? Oh, that's it, to beat the shit out of people. That's what we know of their role in other walks of life. And when I see the images from Brooklyn recently, I don't know if you saw the, uh, the images out of Brooklyn where Palestinian, pro-Palestinian protesters were just beat to the ground by police. To the point where even Mayor Eric Adams, who is a former police officer and is an apologist, basically, for police violence often, even he's like, oh, we got to investigate this. This is bad. They're like punching a guy on the ground. Yeah. And I think, oh, that's familiar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really feel like if, if you're the kind of person who sees the police beating up people on television who are not presenting any sort of like armed response or sort of any sort of attack of any kind, if you're comfortable with that, then me and you are not the same. <laughs> like, we are not the same. And I think that the more the thing that happens is like we get comfortable with police beating up black people during Black Lives Matter protests. We get comfortable with police beating up, you know, college students during these protests. That's all going to come to your doorstep at some point. If you get the more we allow, the more we get comfortable with police beating up people who have not done anything wrong, the more you're basically putting yourself saying, "I accept being in a police state," and I don't accept being in a police state. No, and none of us should. What would you say, Kamal? I'm wondering to somebody who says, "Well, you know, the police are not biased here. They don't have skin in the Israel-Palestine game." Well, you know, why, why, why do you think they're taking a side? What is, what's the best response to that? Do you think? Well, first of all, and I'm sure you know this too, is like a lot of the training that police have uh, has come out of out of things that were tested in in, uh, in the Middle East and Israel. Like a lot of there have been a lot of like back and forth exchanges of techniques that the police in this country have have learned from um, from Israel. So that's one thing. And two, and this is the inconvenient truth that <laughs> that is at the heart of policing. Policing was developed out of one thing: catching escaped slaves. So that's where the institution of policing comes from in this country. In the South, it comes from catching escaped slaves. And then North, it comes from protecting rich white people's property and possessions. So it was not, policing did not come from like, let's, what can we do to help the community? How do we solve a crime? Yeah, how do we solve a crime? It did not start with uh, with Monk and Columbo. <laughs> it did not start there. It, it, it did not, it starts from, we are trying to protect capitalistic interests of white people. 
And it's in the South that capital, capitalistic interest was escaped slaves or slaves or even people who ha were free, but then they could arrest you for loitering if you didn't couldn't prove you had a job. So this is after slavery is over. You could be a free black person walking around, but they're like, do you have a job? Yes, I do. Prove it. I can't. Now they were arrest you and now they put you back under slave conditions. So the institution of policing was built on that and nothing has happened in its whole history that has changed the fun, the foundation of that. Which is why you see like black people being like 12, 30 percent of the population, but being like or 12 percent of the America's population, but like 30 percent of America's prison population. And those numbers, uh, please feel free to check me in the comments. But it, we are way overrepresented in the prison and it's not because we commit more crime or you see about black people being killed by cops. We are killed at a much higher percentage than we should be based on our percentage of the population. So not that we should be killed at cops at all, but it just we over index on the on death by cop. So. And that's because the institutional policing was built, was evolved out of the catching of es escaped enslaved folks. And I know this is hard. It kind of doesn't matter if, the, if there's black police officers. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm not saying I don't want black police officers, but I'm saying I want good police generally. But some people look at like, well, we've got black police officers. That 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 must mean something has happened. But those people learn the same techniques yeah. and the same structures of the policing that was built on, on catching enslaved Africans. So... I, you know, whenever we talk about like, and I live in the Bay Area, I live in Oakland, a lot of the ideas of defund the police come out of here. And we did a whole episode of United Shades about defund the police. And I know that scared people <laughs> and scares people. But really, it's about like, is there a different way to imagine community safety? And there has to be because this one has consistently either not worked or worked perfectly based on your political perspective. When you said uh, black police officers, I'm reminded of all the white liberals who said, so racism is done, right? Because Barack Obama's got elected twice. He's yeah, like, yeah, you have yeah. a black president. We're good. Uh, forget yeah. the rest of the state, society, institutions. Uh, one black guy at the top solves everything. And, and maybe it would have been good if Obama hadn't insulted Trump that one night at that press correspondence dinner. Maybe that, maybe that was the butterfly effect. <laughs> that, is, that is one of the great moments. I actually interviewed Judd Apatow, who helped write that speech. And he's like, yeah, people always blame me for that. Um, so, I'm glad it's not the white guy's fault. That makes me feel <laughs> so I'm just me, curious. What are your thoughts on defund the police? I'm sure you've heard from people about it too. So I was at MSNBC for three and a half years, Kamau. And it's, it's interesting, right? Because defund the police was a line too far for a lot of liberals, for a lot of Democrats who said, let's, let's reform the police. Defund is too far. And there was a, a big concerted campaign, of course, um, after the 2020 election to blame Democratic underperformance in the midterms on defund the police. And I did a lot of segments kind of pushing back against that, saying that's BS. Because um, no police were defunded. <laughs> like, well, no a, no police were defunded. And B, uh, it's not true to say that was the reason why Democrats didn't do well in certain House races in Florida or wherever else. Look, the problem, what I do is there is a messaging issue. Clearly, there's a messaging issue. Like, I wrote a book about persuasion and debate. I get it, right? The, the, people recoil from the phrase, as they have from many activist phrases. What I tend to do personally is whenever I see violence, police brutality on a Twitter clip, I retweet it and say, defund this, right? Mm. Defund this. Who mm -hmm. wants to fund what you're seeing? And I think you've got to be specific with people. For me, it's about police brutality, right? You've got to bring it back to police brutality. I'm an immigrant to this country. I'm from the UK, right? We have police officers who do horrible things, but they don't have guns. And they, it's not as common to see police officers beating people down in the streets. That's not to say British police don't have a lot of issues. They do. Mm -hmm. But I worry that in America now, police brutality has become like school shootings. We've become numb to it. We see it and we go, oh, that's, yeah, well, okay. Uh, what's yeah, next? Yeah. I think we have become numb to it. And I want to be clear about something because I think a lot of times black people get painted with a very broad uh, brush. Uh, there's a lot of black people who aren't excited about the idea of defunding the police. That's true. So I think, and there's a lot of black people who are police officers, a lot of black people who are related to police officers. So it's not an idea that is even fully vetted by the black community. But the but it, and and I also want to say this, like if you imagine when the first slave ship landed and the first uh, Africans got off that ship after that horrible trip from Africa and they're like, what just happened? I would imagine the first thing those Africans said was like, excuse me, could we talk for a second about what just went down and how we can rectify? And those people were killed. You know what I mean? So, like, I think defund the police is just a long, a long and a line of slogans and ways black people in this country have said, can we have our citizenship and our justice? And so if defund the police doesn't work, believe me, there are activists working on new yes. slogans and new techniques right now to say black people just want our freedom and our justice. So I just want to say yeah. that and make that clear. And, 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 and to go back to the idea of specificity as well, when you say you talk about the, the, the big picture is black freedom and equality. Yeah. Uh, and the specifics are 
we don't like people being beat up in the streets, whether they are a black person or a Palestinian person or whoever it is. And also you mentioned the kind of interchange with Israel. The foreign angle to this is very interesting because it's not just the Israeli military, it's the American military that has a huge role in our policing. We now have local police forces in like a town with like six people are driving around in like MRAP armored yeah. vehicles to yeah. like give people speeding tickets. Like what, what? You don't need this weaponry. You don't need this leftover equipment from our shitty war on terror that was a disaster. And all the leftover military spending goes to these police departments. I think that's what we're talking, that's part of defund the police. Who supports this stuff? Who supports police officers dressing like Robocop? Who supports police officers beating unarmed uh, people in the streets? For me, the most memorable image domestically, obviously Gaza images are horrific on a different level, but domestically the most memorable images for me from the last seven months are police officers in, I think it was in Georgia, dragging away a white woman. And she's like, can you call my department? I'm the head of philosophy here. They're like, yeah. the, the yeah. policeman in her, like a balaclava, and he's taking away this unarmed, middle-aged, middle-class white woman. She's a freaking philosopher. And they're mm -hmm. taking away heavily armed cops. I'm, wh what? And that's you what I'm saying. You want to defund that? The more we get used to seeing cops, like we got used to seeing cops beat up and arrest black people and even kill black people. And now they've moved on to young people. Now they're moving on to, to old white women. And we're going to be okay with that? Like, you know, so that means no, they're coming again. All this will eventually be at your doorstep. And then you'll be like, but, but I thought I was protected. It, not if the status quo doesn't want you to be protected. And the other thing I want to say about the whole policing thing, specifically as regards to defund the police, is that the the core of that argument is this country spends too much on policing. If you look at most major cities, like budgets, sometimes up to half of the budget goes to policing. And as my friend Kat Brooks says, who's a part of the anti-police terror uh, project here, police don't prevent crime. They respond to crime. If you take a lot of that money that the, that is being given to the police and reinvest it in the community, you know one thing that does stop crime? jobs which is why i don't like bruce wayne right that's just not the right way to fight crime i love the movies but sorry to be a pedant that is oh. not crime prevention yeah you and chris nolan are gonna have this is gonna get aggregated and chris nolan's gonna have a beef with hey, you i I'm, loved look look i separate my views on art from my views on politics i love the batman movies i loved christian bales I did, i'm not a big fan of the new pattinson one i know everyone loved it not for me I'm a Christian. I, I didn't even see it. I think I, I, I don't know. Maybe have aged out of it. But I was like, I also nothing against him. I feel like I don't want a guy playing a superhero. If I feel like I can beat him up. I don't know that I could. Maybe he could beat me up. I, With all the guys, <laughs> you just need enough gadgets. Superman versus yeah, Batman. Yeah, no, but I feel like I was like he did, and he actually said I didn't even get in shape for the role. Okay, I just oh, can't. No, I can't do that. Before we finish, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta make it personal a bit here, Kamal. Which is, I'm a Muslim. You're a black man. We're in America. We're talking about pro-Palestinian protesters being beaten up by cops. Uh, you've been talking about what happens to black people going back to the first slave ship. What does this mean going forward? Because I know that in the Muslim community, a lot of Muslims listening to this will know that we have these conversations about, you know, we've had it since 9-11, about, you know, are you going to be tired of the terrorists? Every time we get on a plane, we're careful what we say. Um, we're always worried about, we're kind of worried about a different part of the state than your people are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and when I say your people, I mean black people in general. Obviously, there are a lot of black Muslims who are stuck with both. Yeah. Right? No, so they, shout out to my black Muslim brothers and sisters who, who have to deal with both aspects of the identity being under assault. But as a brown Muslim, for me, it's like you're worried about the FBI and the NSA tapping your phone and anti-terror anti -terror laws. And then as a black person, correct me if I'm wrong, you're worried about like the crime of driving while black, like a very basic issue. And I yeah, just wonder I, how much how much do we have to... How much are we still dealing with that as individuals, as parents? How do we how do we let go of that? Can we let go of that? First of all, we shouldn't let go of it. I, I it would be negligence for me to try to let go of it. I got three kids. I have my 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 got my my eighty seven year old mom. I'm responsible for all of them. If I walked around like I'm just a citizen of the United States and I can sort of that would be negligence on my part. I you know it's funny. I'm going to the airport tomorrow. I don't have a lot of fear of the airport. I feel like I can relax at the airport now. There were just <laughs> three black men kicked off a flight because they because they were told they smelled bad, even though that's ridiculous. But I don't have that fear of like going through security at the airport. I can sort of relax there. But I do have the literally the fear of every time I leave my home or my office of like. Be aware of your surroundings, Kamal. Look what's going on around you. And some of that's about crime, but a lot of it is about like, oh, there's a police car over there. Just be aware that there's a police car over there and just be and just be aware of what your hands are doing and what you're doing in the world. So I think that I carry around there's black people in this country. We carry around a lot of baked in fear that we don't even get to talk about all the time because we'll be talking about it all the time. And so you just sort of carry a, a lot of like 
baked in fear of what it is to be outside in the world in America because you're black. And then as a parent, I have three daughters. Their experience is going to be different because they're girls. But I have to sort of prepare them for the fact that, like, you're black and you need to be aware of how the world sees you. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that you mentioned anti-Semitism because what was so fascinating about that piece I mentioned for Zateo that Jonathan Ben Menachem, this uh, uh, postgrad student, wrote for us, is he made the point that actually for Jewish students on campus, the biggest threat right now are the police. It's the mm. same threat for the Muslim students, for the pro-Palestinian students, for all for the black students. There is actually a common factor. Sorry to to any of our uh, police officer audience, but that is what he pointed out, and and that's unfortunately that don't, the receipts are there because we mm -hmm. saw what happened at UCLA where police fired rubber bullets and an encampment filled with Jewish protesters. We saw what happened in Colombia where a police officer fired his gun in the hall where Jewish protesters were around. Uh, we've seen that happen to, as we said, a Jewish academic uh, uh, arrested. Uh, beaten by the police. So it, 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 unfortunately, there is this common thread, which is why I wanted to talk about this topic today. We think it's not just a black issue or a Muslim issue. As you pointed out, if we're going after middle-aged white ladies and we're going after Jewish protesters, then we really need to have a conversation about police more broadly, while also pointing out, as you very eloquently did, is that the students are the ones who are on the right side of this. Yes, yeah. That's the one thing I think we have to really talk about right now, that students, young people... Ten, like I said, the batting average, I, it might be 100%, but they are on the, they are way more on the right side of history than they are on the wrong side of history. I think it's like an NBA good free throw average, like people who shoot over 90%. It's like that. It's basically it's the opposite of my free throw average. I'm very bad at free throws, as you can imagine, as the British immigrant. Um, we're going to get fact-checked in the comments. Let's see. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to this being fact-checked, the 100% batting average. I think you're right. I think it's 100%, but I, I wait to be proven wrong. Um, that is all we have time for. Uh, appreciate you. Uh, co-hosting this with me today. I'm Mehdi Hassan. And I'm W. Kamal Bell. And you have been listening to, watching, appreciating, learning from, I hope. We're not kidding. Kamal's going to be back too. I won't tell you yes, when. I'm, I'm, back your, soon. I'm your bossom break, everybody. Every now and again, you get a bossom break. That's me. We're Not Kidding is a Zateo production. I'm your host, Mehdi Hassan, and today's co-host was W. Kamal Bell. Our executive producers are Misha Youssef and Kieran Alvey. Our producer and editor is Frank Capello. Our music was composed by Andy Clawson. Our design is by Alicia Tetone, and the title card animation is by Ehsan Mezgali. <laughs>